In this video, we're going to take a look at Steve Jobs. Was he an ISTP or an ENTJ? This video is a little advanced. If you're not familiar with the cognitive functions, you can go to whattype.com slash beginner to learn more. If you are familiar with the cognitive functions and you're interested in being able to figure out the personality types of friends and celebrities, you can find more content at whattype.com slash free stuff. And if you'd like me to analyze your personality, you can visit whattype.com slash my type. Okay, Steve Jobs is a man who needs no introduction, so let's get right to it. I've seen Steve Jobs typed as an INTJ and ENTP before, but he seems to be most commonly typed as an ISTP or an ENTJ, and one of those matches my opinion, so I'm going to compare the two and give my take. Now, it seems to me that a lot of explanations for why celebrities are typed certain ways online contain a lot of convoluted, confused theory. But being able to profile accurately isn't about understanding complex theory. 99% of it is about being able to accurately recognize the basics. With that in mind, I'm going to take a very fundamental approach and look at Steve Jobs' personality from two perspectives. Sensor versus intuitive and introverted thinking versus extroverted thinking. Let's start with the sensor intuitive difference. Sensors are more practical and they think and speak in more concrete terms. They don't spend a lot of time thinking or talking about the deep problems of the universe. They want to deal in quote unquote reality. Let's roll a clip of a sensor. This is Mike Rowe, who's an ISTP. When you follow your passion, when you follow your dream, when you grow up being told that you're a precious little snowflake and all you have to do is look inward and identify that thing in you, that you want more than anything else, that's a trap. Because once you see that thing, once you can articulate what that thing is, you're going to make a list of things that you have to do. So, okay, I know I want to be an astronaut. I know that's the thing that's going to make me happy. What do I have to do to get there? And you make this list and you go down that road and you start to cross those things off. And maybe you make it, maybe you don't. Statistically, you're not going to make it. You know why? Because there are only like 100 astronauts. Tough. Okay, it's a tough thing to do. I think when you put passion first, you erect a giant wall. And if you can get over it and get down to the other side, then you get to write the biography and tell the world about how you identified your wish. And people love to read that crap. Okay, Mike Rowe is clearly coming from a very concrete, practical perspective. Here's another sensor, Jim Rohn. We must learn from personal experience. Pretty simple. Learn from what happens to you. Take a look back over the last few months. Did you make some mistakes? How could you correct those for the future? Take a look back over the last year. Have you done it right or done it wrong? Let's correct it for the next year. Learn from your personal experience. Mr. Schoff asked me when I first met him, he said, Mr. Owen, how are you doing? You've been out there now six years. And I said, I'm not doing very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a simple, swift analysis to my situation. He said, if you keep doing it, the next six years will be like the last six. You don't want that to happen. Let's make the changes. That's very simple, fundamental advice. He's not talking about changing the fabric of reality. Intuitives, on the other hand, think more deeply about how the world works, and they're more abstract and metaphorical in their thinking and speech, and they're more restless by nature. Let's watch a clip from an intuitive. This is Matt Bellamy from the band Muse. He's talking about the mechanization of humanity and how it affects our ability to connect with each other. There seems to be a general theme in a lot of the songs, uh, this album and all the albums actually, about just to do with the general mechanization of humanity, you know, like uh, sort of how, how we've been industrialized, the introduction of artificial intelligence, how technology affects our ability to connect to each other and to uh, feel emotions and things like that, you know. So that, that seems to be a theme that emerged over the last two albums. Um, Here's a clip of another intuitive, Andreas Antonopoulos. He's talking about the advent of the internet and how that parallels and relates to the advent of cryptocurrency. Clearly, he's a person who spent a lot of time thinking about possibilities. He's not oriented to the world as it is as much as he's oriented to how it could be. Um, it's so good to be at a conference about the internet because I remember my first internet conference. It was in 1992. There were about 100 people there. Uh, all of them were computer scientists or computer science students. And despite the fact that we were telling the entire world that the world was about to change, 
No one believed us. At least no one believed me, because I was 19 years old and awkward and shy, so that wasn't working so well. But it taught me one thing. It taught me to trust my instincts, because in fact, it did change the world. My second book is called The Internet of Money, and the reason for that is because the technology I'm going to talk about today is about to transform the world in equal measure, and will also transform the Internet itself. Bitcoin, an invention created on January 3rd, 2009, by an anonymous creator, unleashed as an open-source project built by a community of volunteers run as a peer-to-peer -peer network. Derided, laughed at, ignored for the first five, six years. Not so much anymore. People are beginning to pay attention, just like with the internet. Things that were previously unthinkable are now thinkable. People are beginning to notice that this is something more than what they are told. Now let's take a look at some clips of Steve Jobs. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this, uh, erroneous notion that life is is there and you're just gonna live in it. I think one of the the things that really separates us from the high primates is that uh, we're tool builders. Now I read a uh, a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer and uh, humans came in uh, with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. It was not, not uh, too proud of a showing for the crown of creation. So uh, that didn't look so good, but then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle. And a man on a bicycle, or a human on a bicycle, blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. And that's what a computer is to me. Uh, what a computer is to me is it's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. And it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. He sounds very much like an intuitive to me. Now let's take a look at a clip of Steve Jobs and John Scully, who's an ESTJ. Because Jobs, an intuitive, was so unorthodox, there was a need to bring on a CEO who was more practical and traditional, a censor. While Jobs pursued his Mac mission, he needed a more orthodox chief executive to run the company, a respectable face who could sell to corporate America. He chose Pepsi-Cola executive John Scully. Scully refused. Leave Pepsi for a four-year-old company that had been set up in a garage? Are you serious? But it was hard saying no to Steve Jobs. And then he looked up at me and just stared at me with this stare that only Steve Jobs has. and. He said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life, or do you want to come with me and change the world? The line about sugar water is classic intuitive. Scully had built his career working for a large, established company where he used traditional methods of marketing and research. Jobs was bent on changing the world, and he used unconventional methods to make it happen. Now let's take a look at some advertisements. This is an ad that Pepsi ran in 1982 when John Scully was president of the company. I don't know if he had anything to do with this ad, but either way, this is an ad for censors. Got 
Now contrast that with the famous Think Different commercial that Jobs wrote. This is clearly an intuitive approach to advertising, and in fact, the vast majority of the people in that ad were or are intuitives. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Let's take a look at one more for good measure. This is the original commercial for the Macintosh that aired on New Year's Eve 1983. The Macintosh was Steve Jobs' project. He took ownership of it. You'd have a hard time convincing me that a censor would produce an ad like this for their project. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh, and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. In my mind, there's no question Steve Jobs was an intuitive. So let's move on and compare the primary functions of ISTP and ENTJ, introverted thinking and extroverted thinking. Introverted thinking sees things more holistically. TI users want to understand the entire picture of what they're doing and how all the pieces fit together. They're accuracy oriented. They want elegance and precision, even sometimes at the expense of effectiveness. And they're more likely to enjoy technical projects for their own sake. Here's a video of a TI primary, Steve Wozniak. This is indicative of introverted thinking. He wasn't after a specific outcome. He was engrossed in projects for their own sake. What I was doing around that time was not even thinking about what, it, what are the right steps to take to have a very large successful company or a large successful product. It was just, I, I had been working my whole life to build a certain type of computer for myself and I just built the best one that was doable in that day with the particular components available, etc. And um, in that sense it wasn't sort of like, it wasn't like an intelligence that, that can lead you towards the right path. It was just being very free. I, was, I had the freedom because I was only doing it for myself. It was not a company project where a manager defined what, you know, what had to be done. So I was lucky to be able to do what I did. TE users start with the outcome in mind. They reverse engineer from their desired result and figure out the steps it will take to achieve it. They're effectiveness oriented and constantly measure their actions by asking themselves if what they're doing or saying is helping them achieve something. TE users want to get to the outcome. They're not as inclined to geek out on technical details. Here's a clip of Gary Vaynerchuk. The contrast between him and Steve Wozniak should be stark. He wasn't immersed in the joy of geeking out. He was making things happen, even as a little kid. Edison, New Jersey is where I started my entrepreneurial career. Um, in Edison, I basically put all my friends to work. So when I was six, I had eight lemonade stands in Edison, New Jersey, a franchise. You guys remember Big Wheels, that little like thing, Big Wheels? I used to ride my Big Wheels in Edison, New Jersey and pick up my cash like I was Tony Soprano. <laughs> it was pretty interesting. Now let's take a look at some clips of Steve Jobs. Notice how he's always looking at the outcome. 
He's asking questions like, what do people want to do with the products we create? What do we need to do to produce the result we are after? What are the key metrics that we need to measure to see if we're on track? And how many of a product can we sell? Again, it's, you know, the whole computer industry wants to forget about the humanist side right. and just focus on the technology. And um, a lot of our industry focuses just on more is better, more megahertz and megabytes mm -hmm. and, you know, s speeds and feeds, we call it. Mm -hmm. But we think there's a whole other side to the coin, which is what do you do with these things? Can we do more than just spreadsheets and word processors? Mm -hmm. Can we help you express yourself in richer ways, in your music, in your movies, in your photography, and these kinds of things that people want to do? Uh, that is, it, that's like a bomb run. You don't change your, your target when you're in the bomb run. From the sidelines, jobs, probes, and challenges. He has a remarkable ability to identify the conclusions implicit in what the others have to say. Uh, so really, the next 90 days are real important. We are going to make it or break it based on whether we can provide products to higher education and services and relationships to higher education that no one else provides. And I think we ought to spend 100% of our time thinking about that. And if we can't do that, then we ought to go broke. There needs to be someone who is sort of the um, keeper and reiterator of the vision. There was the price one, the schedule one, the technology. and technology. Yeah. Jobs continually interrupts to focus the lens of his vision on priorities. By the end of the first day, the team has established the critical importance of keeping the price of the computer within the reach of students and professors and bringing the product to market by spring 1987. A survey of college campuses has indicated that the new computer should sell for no more than $3,000 to be considered affordable. Since college buying takes place in the summer, Jobs is concerned that a failure to have their product ready by spring 1987 will delay the company an entire year. If we don't deliver this by spring 87, we're out of business. We know so we my first priority is to make sure this damn thing is out, out by yeah. spring 87. I, I think spring can basically push out to summer. summer, but I also hear that that is number one. Well, we couldn't make this 5,000. I think we're in a, they didn't say if you made it go three times faster, we'd pay 4,000. They didn't say that. That's right. They said if it's $3,000, it's a hot product. They, were, they said, you're over 3,000, forget it. Yeah. That that's their magic number. They've also told us that nobody else says they can do that. And they think that's a really big number. Now, whether it is or not, in reality, who knows? Mm -hmm. Whether it is or not in terms of their commitment yes. to push us, we've established that. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. I said, I was very excited too, right? I said, what about an old G3 Pismo power book with all new guts inside of it? Why can't you make that? And he just said like this, because we'd sell 14 of them. <laughs> okay, so he definitely sounds like a TE user to me. In fact, I think one of the keys to Apple's success in the early days was the combination of Steve Wozniak's TI and Steve Jobs' TE. Wozniak was a true hardcore engineer. He was giving away his work for free because he loved what he did for its own sake. Jobs, though, saw a huge opportunity and he was able to leverage Steve Wozniak's talent to revolutionize the home computer industry and make a boatload of money. I'd been showing off my computer at the Homebrew Computer Club. I had given away my designs for the Apple I for free. Steve Jobs came into town. He'd pop into town, see what I was up to, the latest thing I designed for fun, and then he'd somehow turn them into some money for both of us. Now let's take a look at a funny clip from comedian Bill Burr, who's a TI user. Notice how he puts far more value on the actual creation of the product than on Jobs' vision for it. This is T.I. undervaluing T.E. with a sense of humor. I didn't get it. I didn't get the big deal they made about that guy. When he died, they were like, he changed the world. That was insane. He changed the world. The world was one way. And then Steve Jobs came. And it was another. <laughs> what did he do? Somebody, for the love of God, what the f did that guy do? What did he do? He told other people what to invent? I want my entire music collection in that phone. Get on it! Right? 
And then these poor, nameless, faceless scientists gotta go in a back room and figure it out. How the f are we gonna get all of this into this? I mean, what year does this guy think this is? This is crazy. This is like Buck Rogers. Dude, my kid has a birthday in like 11 months. Steve Jobs just walking by. I don't hear any thinking going on in there. Just strutting around the office, eating some pretentious fruit like a pear, right? Just throwing out ideas. There's another one. There's another one I just came up with on the way to work. I was reading a magazine the other day, turning pages, you know? I like to turn pages on a screen that aren't even there. Yeah, wrap your fucking heads around that, guys! See you in eight years! Where are you going, Michael? Big, little, big, little, get on it! Here's another clip to illustrate the difference between TI and TE. The person asking the question here is almost certainly a TI user. His thinking is coming from the inside out. It's starting from an internal technical perspective. Jobs is coming from the opposite perspective. He's thinking from the outside in, starting with the result and then figuring out how to get there. Mr. Jobs, you're a bright and influential man. Here it comes. <laughs> sad and clear that on several counts you've discussed, you don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> I would like, for example, for you to express in clear terms how, say, Java, in any of its incarnations, addresses the ideas embodied in Open Duck. And when you're finished with that, perhaps you could tell us what you personally have been doing for the last seven years. Uh, you can please some of the people some of the time, but one of the hardest things when you're trying to affect change is that people like this gentleman are right in some areas. I'm sure that there are some things OpenDoc does, probably even more that I'm not familiar with, that nothing else out there does. And I'm sure that you can make some demos maybe a small commercial app that demonstrates those things. The hardest thing is, what, how does that fit in to a cohesive, larger vision that's going to allow you to sell um, $8 billion, $10 billion of product a year? And one of the things I've always found is that You've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to try to sell it. And as we have tried to <clears throat> come up with a strategy and a vision for Apple, um, it started with what incredible benefits can we give to the customer? Where can we take the customer? Not, not starting with, let's sit down with the engineers and, and figure out what awesome technology we have and then how are we gonna market that. So there you have it. In my opinion, Steve Jobs was an ENTJ. He was a brilliant salesman and creative visionary. He didn't start with the technical details. He started by thinking about what people could do with his products and how he could sell them. He didn't start by asking what could be done with a new piece of technology. He started by asking things like, can we build something that will hold someone's entire catalog of music in their pocket? And can we make it the size of a deck of cards? This is an NTJ approach to sales and product creation. He started by thinking about the customer experience and how he could communicate the true value of the product in terms that they could easily understand. He used extroverted thinking and introverted intuition to visualize outcomes, refine his visions for efficiency and elegance, and to reverse engineer the steps to bring his visions to life. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you like this kind of stuff, you'll want to go to whattype.com slash join to become a member. We've got more celebrity videos, a library of lessons full of video examples, and a community where you can have your questions answered and where you can debate type in a respectful environment. Try it out for a week for just a dollar.